Well, as Micah said, today is the final week of our series where we've been looking at how the boundaries regarding sex in our culture today have gotten so blurred. When it comes to the subject of sex, there are many opinions, way more than we could even identify in a 30-minute message. Sex is that one area where we have trouble agreeing on where the guardrails should be. Guardrails are those moral boundaries that we all recognize that protect us. And there is this great debate in the world over where those guardrails should be or whether there should be guardrails at all. And my hope through this message is that we can continue examining God's truth for our sexuality today and see how that truth could actually improve our lives. I think of these biblical truths as those guardrails that I was talking about. These scriptures are designed to keep us on the best path that God designed for us, that that path that protects us from the trouble that exists beyond the guardrails. So I want to encourage you, wherever you come from, whatever direction of life you're coming from, I want to encourage you to have an open mind. At least give God a chance to represent the truth that he presents to us in his Bible with regard to this topic of sex. As I've said through this whole series, these messages really were all designed to be in one sermon. But my wife told me, you really can't talk for more than 25 minutes about sex. That was a rule she had. And then no personal illustrations, okay? Uh, I told her last night, I'm going to testify tomorrow. And she said, no, you're not. (laughs) So if you've missed uh, one of these messages or both of the first two talks, I hope you'll go back and check them out online because they really do layer on each other. They're, they're meant to uh, be interconnected. And so you're going to miss out if this is the only part that you hear. I hope you'll do that. How you think about sex has tremendous impact on your identity, how you see God, and how you connect with others. There's been a lot of misinformation that's been disseminated about sexuality over the past several decades. So through this series, I just want us to look at the truth and expose some of these fallacies or these myths that we've been told. Truth can get blurred by lies. If we tell them enough, people will actually begin to think that the lies are actually true. So let's look at these fallacies and why they're not true And then I want us to look at how God's truth can actually give us a better life. Is that fair? All right. We're going to pick up with fallacy number four. We covered the first three in in talks one and two. Fallacy number four. Everyone needs to experiment sexually before they settle down in a long-term relationship. I put on there, I should get to sow my wild oats. And you know what wild oats is? That's kind of a metaphor or a little, little saying that says, hey, I get to do the things that I know are bad, but I want to do. People talk about sowing their wild oats before they settle down. The truth is, sexual sins have a devastating impact on people's lives. People have these thoughts, though, about sowing their wild oats. They say, everything you said so far in this series, Monty, I agree with. I believe that. And I'm, going, I'm really going to do that in about three or four years from now. God's forgiving, right? Just reassure me of that. I just can't bear the thought of missing out on all the fun that everybody else is having. And I see it online. I see it in, in all kinds of media. I see that. People are having great times. I know God will forgive me for whatever I do. So I'm going to go and have my fun. And then when I get closer to settling down I'll, and starting a family, then I'll do things God's way. Here's the truth, though. Sexual sins have a uniquely destructive impact on our lives. Unlike any other sin, sexual sin can do serious damage to your life because it's a sin against yourself. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the sexually confused city of Corinth, he explained to them in 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 17, he said, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You see how sexuality and spirituality are so closely intertwined with one another? 
Our claims to have a relationship with God means that we are subjecting him to whatever the illicit behavior is that we're engaged in. He is with us during that shameful one-night stand. He's there every time you reconnect and hook up in an affair. He's there when you lock the door and log on to that adult site. Paul gives the answer and the application for this behavior, he says, simply flee from sexual immorality. You can almost hear him pleading with the people. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Our bodies and what we do with them is a very serious issue with God. He is holy and pure and awesome. He's all-knowing. He's the powerful creator of the universe, and he dwells inside every one of his children. And when you decide to have illicit sex or engage in pornography or some other sexual sin, it's like driving your Ferrari and deciding to take it four-wheeling. It's just not made to do that. That's what happens when you have sex outside of the bonds of marriage. That's what happens when you fantasize sexually about your coworker. That's what happens when you look at pornography. You are going where you shouldn't go, and you're taking God with you. You cut yourself off from God when you decide to sow your wild oats. And one of the these key areas where this is happening exponentially in our culture is in the area of pornography. And I want to spend a few minutes here just shining some light into this darkness. Many people believe that pornography is harmless. They think that it's just looking at pictures or videos of naked people or people having sex. Besides, it's my business, right? It doesn't hurt me and I can do whatever I want as long as I don't hurt someone else or affect other people. And that's how many of us think about porn. But its influence is significantly worse than we ever could have ever imagined. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation issued an extensive report titled Pornography and Public Health. It came out in September of last year. Here's just a small sampling of the overwhelming amount of data. Pornography has a significant influence on the human brain. Since 2009, more than 30 major studies have revealed that pornography has negative and detrimental impacts on the human brain. A 2014 study actually found increased pornography use is linked to decreased brain matter. Your brain is actually getting smaller. Pornography also promotes sexual violence. Analysis of the 50 most popular pornographic videos found that 88% of the scenes in those videos contained physical violence and 49% contained verbal aggression. You're going to get a steady diet of that through pornography. In 2015, there was a meta-analysis that found consumption of pornography was significantly associated with increases in verbal and physical aggression. Pornography also has an adverse effect on relationships. A study found people having an extramarital affair were more than three times more likely to have used internet pornography. Studies also show that more, the more porn a man watches, the less he enjoys sex with his partner. And pornography is also influencing the church. 93% of pastors say pornography is a bigger problem than it was in the past. And more than half of youth pastors have had at least one teen come to them for help in dealing with porn in the last 12 months. And I... I can promise you that the reality of the influence of pornography in every facet of the culture, including the church, is significantly worse than you could probably imagine. 
Pornography is having a far greater negative impact on most areas of life. And some of you know that because it seems to have a real grip on your life. Recently, I had a a young woman come to me to talk to me about her ex-husband. She had never shared this before, but she said that he had been heavily involved in pornography, and one of the things that he insisted on was raping her. Just grieved my heart. Although God is ready to forgive us and listen to us the moment we call on him, sexual disobedience eventually causes God to close his ears. It cuts off your ability to hear his voice and experience his presence. There is a darkness there that seems to not exist in most areas of life. Listen to what Isaiah 59 says. It's a powerful verse. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, that means sins, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. God grieves over us. He's jealous for us as his children. In his love, he disciplines us with consequences and sometimes even pain, hoping that we will realize that what we're doing is unacceptable to him. What's troubling today, though, is that sexual immorality in all of its forms, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, pornography, even simply lusting, have become so much more acceptable by people within the confines of God's church. And the result is... We've lost our moral edge in the culture, and we've lost some of our influence to share the gospel. Here's the warning. Sexual sin has its roots in spiritual rebellion and idolatry. We find this in Scripture. You see, there's a part in all of us that says, at some point in our lives, no one is going to tell me what to do. Not even you, God. I have these urges or I have these desires, whatever the context might be. And when one says to God, I'm doing things my way, what they're doing is taking a step and maybe even taking a leap into rebellion. And in the Bible, when you rebel against God, it is serious business to God. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, if you have your Bible and want to flip over there to Ephesians 5, we'll start with verse 3. He says, Ephesians 5, he makes this connection between rebellion and idolatry and the connection that it has with sexual sin. He was writing to Christians in Ephesus, which was another kind of sexually saturated city. They had the temple of Diana there that was complete with prostitutes and all kinds of debauchery. And these people actually engaged in that as part of their worship. These people had come to know Christ in this decadent sexual society. And listen to what Paul says in verse three. He says, but among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed. I wanna talk about that word. Just hit the pause on that verse for a second. That word greed actually doesn't mean greed with regard to money or possessions. He's talking about sexual greed here. Think about that. It means coveting the sins of the flesh. You're greedy for the sins of the flesh. Paul goes on to offer this reason that there shouldn't be any hint of sexual immorality, impurity, or this kind of greed. He says, because these are improper for God's holy people. That isn't who we are, he says. We're better than that. Not that we're better because of our performance, but we can be more like God because we're his people and we were meant to be holy. And then Paul shifts from their behavior to focusing on their speech, which is a big part of this whole immorality issue as well. He says, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse jesting, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. That's how we should be. We should be thankful in our speech. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, he says, 
has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. He's saying, cut off your connection with them if that's the route they're going to go because they're going to lead you in the wrong direction. He said that's actually a form of idolatry when they're living such immoral lives. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. When your sexual practice in mind, if it's only happening here, he's talking about that, in, your, in what you say or with your body, is opposed to what God says, when your behavior is opposed to what God says, he wants you to understand that you are actually worshiping you rather than him. You're worshiping yourself rather than the Lord God Almighty. And whether it's using people or viewing images, you are the central focus and you're dominated by a lust for something you can't achieve on your own. When you're worshiping yourself, that's actually spiritual rebellion. It is a form of rejecting God. Going back to Paul's words in Ephesians 5.5, 5, he says, no immoral, impure, or greedy person. He's talking about habits here. People who have sexually immoral patterns in their lives, habits that they, that they engage in on a regular basis. This doesn't mean that you don't slip up on occasion. Now, I don't think you can accidentally have an affair, you know, annually. That's not what we're talking about, okay? Some of you are going, oh, so there's a loophole. No, there really isn't. This doesn't mean that you don't slip up because we know that on occasions we do. But if Paul is describing the ongoing practices in your life here, then he and the rest of Scripture say that there really are two options that you have. The first one is if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, if you have confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior, you put your faith in him and you were baptized into Christ, but over time, you have compromised and sinned repeatedly to the point that you're trapped in dysfunctional sexuality. You need to repent. You can't claim authentic belief in Jesus while deliberately pursuing sin. He deserves better than that. Option number two. You've been living with this misconception about your relationship with Jesus. Maybe there was a point in your life when you prayed a prayer or you raised your hand at the right time when the minister said and you reached some intellectual agreement with the gospel and you said, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross and rose from the dead. I prayed a prayer. I actually go to church and that's all good. And intellectual agreement, it is part of faith, but it's not the whole part. Trusting in Jesus is life-changing. It's life-changing. God will accept you where you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there. Trusting in Jesus is life-changing, and it continues to be life-changing as we fall and as we stumble. And he helps us to continue. He doesn't, want to, he doesn't want you to stay there. When you fall sexually, when you sin sexually, he doesn't go, you disappoint me. He's there to pick you up and say, you can do better than this. I intended life better than that. When the Holy Spirit lives within a believer, he creates a desire for holiness. And eventually, if you aren't careful, your sexual sin will reveal there is no desire for holiness. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, a tree is recognized by its fruit. If the fruit of your life is habitual sexual immorality, then you need to be honest with yourself and ask the question, does the Holy Spirit still live in me? Or have I shut him down because of my immoral behavior? It may be time for change, and change is possible. 
though a lot of people don't think that it is. Which brings us to the fifth fallacy. And that is that sexual sin I've committed is too powerful. Nothing can remove its grip on my life. And there's nothing more further from the truth than that lie. It's just a lie. You see, the truth is Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and break its power in our lives. And that includes sexual sin. Whatever you've done, whenever you've done it, however many times you've done it, God has the power through Jesus to forgive you of your sins and break the power of that sin in your life. This myth is one that I'm imagining that some of you in this room might be thinking right now. You feel hopeless. This series has just messed you up. You haven't enjoyed it at all. Truthfully, I can see this Uh, It's not been fun for most of us, to be honest. You're not even sure that you want to give up your sexual sin, though you now realize God is offering you truth that you may not have ever considered before. He can change your life. He can set you free from the sin. Chip Ingram, one of my favorite authors, tells a story about playing basketball. Chip's a great basketball player. And over the years, several years ago, he had a conversation after a summer game with a guy from University of Southern California. He said this guy was a great athlete, and he was great looking. You know, he was one of those surfer types who has California written all over him, kind of like me, you know. (laughs) After the game one night, Chip knew this guy was a Christian, and he said to him, he said, hey, tell me, how, how'd you come to Christ? How, how'd you become a Christian? And the guy started to tell his story, and then he stopped. And he got very emotional. I had to kind of gather his words. And then he stood there looking like some guy who should be on some poster in some teenage girl's bedroom. And yet his voice came out with this broken humility, just full of grief. He said, there was a time a few years ago When I didn't have sex every day, I had sex multiple times a day with as many women as possible in high school and throughout college. Women were available to me, he said. I helped myself. I actually got so numb to what I was doing that I sometimes had sex and I didn't feel anything. And at that point, the young man said, I got deathly afraid because I realized the only thing that could give me the sexual buzz that I wanted would be to begin exploring perversion, and that step scared me to death. He said, I remember crying out to God and saying, I'm a prisoner, will someone please help me, even though I didn't think there was any help for me. He said, but shortly after that calling out to God, through a friend, God brought Jesus into my life, and it changed that young man's life for all eternity. It's set him free. You may think there's no hope for you either. You say, I'm too far gone, Monty. I get it. I hear what you're saying, but you have no idea where I've been or what I've done. Or maybe you think, I'm not worth saving. The things I've done, they're terrible. I recognize it. I've gone into the perversion. I've gone way past the numbness. I'm so ashamed of who I am and what I've become. I don't deserve to be forgiven. That's my punishment. Maybe you feel that way. Shame is so common among people who sin sexually. Shame can be so strong that a person will never admit to any other person his or her sin, and they'll just continue to suffer all alone because of that shame. Dana Carvey created a character on SNL known as the Church Lady. Some of you will recognize her. In that special, (laughs) she had she. Her name is Enid Strict. She's the uptight, pious host of her own talk show, Church Chat, and she interviews her celebrity guests so she can call them out on their various sins, culminating with her judgmental condemnation. And the parody is so deep and so extreme that it's almost comical. Except it's really not. I wonder if people sometimes see their lives through the eyes of the church lady. They hear her voice in their head. She points out how shameful your actions are. 
And she reminds you of the condemnation that's coming because of what you've done. And nobody can forgive you. You're destined for hell. Shame can be crippling, so ashamed of our actions that we're often paralyzed by embarrassment of someone finding out our secret. The kingdom of God is grace-based. And it's open to everyone. There was something wrong with us, but God, through his grace, made us new creatures through Christ. Now we can live a righteous life as children of God. We are what we are because of the grace of God. What you're saying about your sins may be true. They may be terrible. They may be something not meant for public consumption, but that doesn't have to be the end of your story. God can rewrite the end. He can change it. That's how powerful his grace is. Here's what I want you to understand. Jesus died to pay for the penalty of your sins. You may not understand all that that means, but you need to know that what he did on the cross can break the power of sin in your life while you are still a sinner. He cared. Jesus died. Before you committed any sin, he loved you. And he still loves you now. And he wants something better for you. And because he loves you, he doesn't want you to continue on the path that you've been on. To receive that love and be cleansed and forgiven and to begin to experience the kind of sexuality that God wants for you, you have to make a change. I want to give you a Three quick steps. The first is this. you got to be honest with yourself. Not long ago, I sat across the table from a guy, and I said, you have a problem. He's had multiple affairs through his life, and I said, you talk about living happily ever after, but that's not going to happen in your life because you continually do this. I said, you know that's true, right? And he said, yeah. And yet he doesn't want to change doesn't want to do the hard work to change. Where you are right now, can you be honest with yourself? This might be one of the most pivotal moments of your life. Is there a decision you need to make before you turn and walk out of here that will change the trajectory of your life forever? Are you willing to be honest with yourself? Because that's where it starts. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 145, 18. He says, the Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. You gotta be truthful. You gotta be honest. Step number two, repent and confess. Repentance means changing direction. It's a change of mind. It's a U-turn, if you will, on the journey of life. The way I'm living and what I'm doing are not good anymore. I'm changing the direction of my life. I'm changing my mind. And to confess, that means you agree with God about what he's pointed out in you that needs changing. You agree. That's sin and it needs to go. The promise is that if we agree with God, if we confess our sins in the case in this case, we confess our sexual sin of thought, of word, or of actions. God is faithful to forgive us of our sins. Not just forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Look at 1 John 1, 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now let me say this. If this is the first time you've ever heard this, that you've never put your faith in Jesus. You, you have to take that step first to trust him. Put your faith in him. Repent and confess and be baptized into Christ Jesus. You need to take that step of faith first. And once you've done that, the third step is simply to abandon your sinful behavior. And it may not be simple. I recognize that. But you have to. Finally, you need to disown the sin in your life. Listen to what Proverbs says. Whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. That means if you're having an affair today, 
You don't just slide out of it and not, don't call them. You call that person today and you say it's over and you never have contact with them ever again. If you're connected in any way, shape, or form with pornography and it has a grip on your life, you get in touch with someone of the same gender, someone who you can trust, and you say, hey, I need your help. Whatever you do, be as radical about it as you need to be. That's what Jesus meant when he said, hey, if your right eye sins, causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Now, he didn't literally mean gouge your eye out or cut your hand off, okay? Just for for those of you that thought, whoa, this is serious commitment here, okay? Because the truth is this, you could gouge out one eye and still lust with the other eye. Let's be honest, right? But what he meant was sin has to be treated as a deadly danger. He's telling us to take drastic action to deal with it. Do whatever God calls you to do because your heavenly father has a perfect plan to love you and to give you what is best for your life. And you're not experiencing that. I promise you, if you're in some habitual sexual sin, you're not experiencing the abundant life. This has been a tough series, not because of the topic, though that makes sense, right? It's kind of touchy and a lot of people feel uncomfortable and some people disagree vigorously and that's okay. But it's been tough because of the spiritual fight that's been going on before this series and all the way through it. And I have, to, I have to believe that when the enemy ramps up to hit us this hard, this had to be something that he was absolutely terrified that we would shine light on. So don't miss what God wants you to hear here. Let me ask you a few questions and then we'll pray. Have you believed some of these lies through this series, we talked about five of them. Have you believed any of those in your life? I hope you'll let God's truth lead you to a better path. I hope you'll acknowledge those guardrails that he set up and try to stay inside of them because it's a safer way, it's a healthier way, it is a better way. That's the path of abundant life. Can you begin to imagine that sex is something that is sacred from God, it's a gift to us, not something dirty or illicit or broken or or dangerous, but something holy? Could you start to see it that way? And maybe the most important thing is, do you realize that wherever you are or whatever you've done, Jesus extends an offer to forgive you and to give you a fresh start because you matter to God. Sex is a sacred gift and he wants you to get the fullest out of it. So decide today you will never settle for anything but the very best. You deserve nothing less. What I want to do is I want to ask you to stand and I want to pray and and I'm going to just walk through kind of a guided prayer. I want you to take some time to do a little business with God. I promise we're not gonna be here forever, just a few minutes. If you'll indulge me, if you'll stand. I just wanna guide you through just a couple bullet points here. God, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, the path of forgiveness that is ahead for some in this room. I'm grateful, God, that you didn't just wipe us out because of our sin. But Lord, I recognize we have to admit that we've sinned sexually. If that's the case in our lives, I pray today that the folks in this room who have to do this business with you right now will recognize what you're pointing out in their life. Maybe it's pornography or maybe it's lust and maybe they're fantasizing sexually about someone else. Maybe they're going to strip clubs or having sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend and they're not married, or maybe they're involved in an affair, even right now. I wanna encourage you just to call out to God, just admit to him, confess to him your sin and ask him for his forgiveness. Will you do that right now, just quietly?
I want you to realize that there is power in sin. It has the ability to drive a wedge in your relationship with God if it becomes habitual. And you, we stop hearing his voice. He will allow us to suffer the consequences. So before you get any further away, drifting from him, I want you just to declare before him that you're repenting. You're, you're making a U-turn away from sin. You're turning back to him. Will you just take a moment to declare that you are repenting of that sin before the Lord? <clears throat> if this is the first time you've ever heard about God's forgiveness for your sin, it's the first time that you've seen a glimmer of hope that this habitual sin that you are kind of stuck in can be broken. The chains of that can be broken. You can be given a new start. You need to put your faith in Jesus. You need to be baptized into him. And I would tell you, you should do that today, sooner rather than later. I wanna encourage you to ask God for courage this morning to take that step. And if you're a believer in Christ, I wanna encourage you to pray for someone who you know struggles in this area of sexual sin or someone who needs Jesus in their life. Let's take a moment and pray for this. The Bible says that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If Jesus washes your sins away, your sins are washed away. As far as the East is from the West, God says he remembers our sins no more, which is really remarkable because he's the all-knowing God. He knows everything except the things he chooses to forget, which are your sins, when you turn them over to Jesus and let him wash them away. God, thank you today for dying for us and washing our sins away. I am so grateful, God, for that in my life. And I pray every person here would have that same assurance that their sins are washed away because they put their life in the hands of Jesus. God, thank you that you accepted us where we were. But thank you also, God, for not wanting us to stay there. You want better for us so that we might have this life and have it abundantly, the best life. God, we're grateful for that. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.